as Jesus lived his life as a faithful steward. So if we're going to live God's life in God's way, we need to learn to live in that accountable relationship with the Father as a faithful steward over all that he has placed in our care and has entrusted us. That is the, the parable that Jesus taught. Now, Jesus tells stories and takes the illustrations from a common day, everyday life. And so the people who heard this illustration understood what Jesus was saying. There were servants who were stewards. And a steward is someone who is given care over another person's property to watch over it. And so this king, this ruler, was leaving on a long journey, and he had three servants uh, that he entrusted talents to. Now, we look at that, and oftentimes we say, well, talents is, you know, the things that I can do. In the, Old, in, in, in the New Testament, a talent was a sum of money. It was actually a weight. It was 75 pounds. And they were either given a talent of silver or a talent of gold. It doesn't say. But I calculated out what a talent of silver costs today with today's prices. It would be about $170,000. A talent of gold would be $1.2 million. Yikes. And this ruler gives, he calls his servants together and he gives them large sums of money to invest. Imagine having five talents. Oh, what is that, you know? Seven or eight million dollars to invest. Two talents, 2.4 million. Um, you know, one talent, talent 1.2 million. You know, we think that's feeling sorry for this one guy who got this one talent. He only got one talent. No, it's a huge amount of money. And, and, and the ruler, the master, trusted the servants. These servants had been trained. You know, he didn't simply call someone out of the field and say, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm giving you this money and I, I hope it works out. No, he had trained them. They were household servants. They understood how to invest. They understood uh, economics um, and, and they, there was something that the master could trust in them, and now he brings them to a test. That was Jesus' parable. How were they going to manage the assets of their master when their master was away? Well, t- two of them invest, and when the master returns, says, you gave me five, here's five more. You gave me two, here's two more. Investments worked out. And they said, well done, good and faithful servant. That one servant is like, yikes. $1.2 million, that's a lot of money. I don't want to lose it. I don't want to take any risks. So he runs and hides it in the ground, (coughs) which is a risk in and of itself. But but he hides it in the ground. When the master comes, he returns it to him without any increase. And he is scolded as a wicked and lazy servant. So what's Jesus saying in this? What's he saying to us? Well, first of all, um, we are stewards over our master's goods. We are those servants that have been entrusted with the goods of the master. What are the goods that Jesus has entrusted us with? Your life, your children, your financial resources, your time. Everything about your life has been entrusted to you by God because God owns everything, doesn't he? Psalm 24, one says, the, the, Lord, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and, and we're part of that fullness thereof. God owns property. He owns everything. He owns us, you and me. And so we live our life as a steward of God. Everything he's put in our care, our opportunities, the giftings of our life, our personality, all those things are gifts from God. Our very life itself is a gift from God. Why are you here? Because God created you specifically. Now, a steward, as I said, is someone who is responsible to care for somebody else's property. So, Haley, do you have your driver's license? Not yet. You get your driver's license, and someone 
loans you their car, how are you going to drive that car? Very carefully, right? Particularly if it's a brand new car with only 10 miles on it, right? I just upped the game, right? You're going to be extremely careful. That's what stewards are. Stewards care for somebody's property even more, uh, with more care than their own. How are you a steward of God's property, your life? Changes the way we look at things, doesn't it? A proper understanding of stewardship begins with understanding of who we are. Our identity is the key. The first two servants understood their identity. They weren't just servants. They were trusted family members because a household servant is more like a family. The lazy servant saw himself only as a servant, not trusted. You know, our identity, we are sons and daughters of the king. Jesus is our elder brother. We've been adopted into the family of God. God looks at us and he says, we are his sons and his daughters. He doesn't have grandchildren. We are in a privileged position because of Christ. When we come to Christ and we give our lives to him, and, and, and he sets us free from our sin in the past, and he forgives us. He does more than that. He, he invests us with life, a different kind of life than just simply breathing and walking around type of life. It's God's life. And he, he changes our identity from being sinners to being sons and daughters of the king. And when we look at our lives that way, it changes the way we look at being a steward. You see, we were bought with a price, Jesus' life given on the cross. We are loved by God, accepted by God. We look at our lives and we say, well, does he accept me? Look what I did this week. Yet he accepts you because of Christ. And then when we start with that identity, it changes the way we approach stewarding our lives, our property, our opportunities. Because it is far better to be accountable to a loving father than to a grouch, right? God loves us and he wants us to exceed. Now, the second thing is God has given us talents. Just like the servants here were given talents. God has given us resources, all kinds of things. And, and he's, it says he gave according to each according to their ability. So God has given us opportunities, personality, resources. He has given us spiritual gifts and natural gifts, each according to our ability. Why did he give us all these things? They are his. And we are to steward them for his glory. We live our lives not for ourselves, but for God. You see, God is not interested in our comfort. He's interested in our training. He wants us to be sons and daughters who join with him in the family business and who are involved with uh, uh, seeking to promote the, the welfare of his kingdom. And so each of us has a capacity. God has invested things in your life. Some of those things you haven't even discovered yet. And this capacity is our area of servanthood. That capacity means um, literally the, the sum of our abilities, our personalities, of who we are, everything about our life. There's a capacity that we have. It's like, you know, uh, a, a glass has a certain capacity in terms of volume, and a, a gallon jug has a larger capacity, and a 55-gallon drum has a larger capacity. We have capacities in our life based on how God created us. Or you could say spheres of influence. Some of us have capacities that, that, that are just work best with a one-on-one. -on -one. There are other people like Billy Graham who had a capacity for international ministry. Not everyone's a Billy Graham. But if Billy Graham didn't follow through in his destiny... And, 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 and allow his capacity to be stretched to do all that God wanted him to do, then he would be like that lazy servant who had his, hid his talent in the sand. 
Now, does that mean that Kristen now has to be like Billy Graham or she's hiding her talent in the sand? Of course not. Because that's not your capacity. But when we come into a relationship with Jesus and we understand our identity, then the next question is, Lord, I love you. Where do you want me to serve? What have you placed in my life? What tools have you given me? Can I speak? Can I teach? Am I an artist? Do I like to work with my hands? How do you use those gifts to further God's kingdom? You see, capacity uh, defines our area of service. And Jesus uh, said in his parable that, uh, uh, you know, that as he gave the talents to the servants, he understood their capacity. One had a capacity for five, one had for two, one had for one. The amount they received was not important. He gave them according to their ability, their capacity. What they did with it was the key. And, um, and then he said, whoever is faithful over little will gain more. You know, God will, if we begin to use what he's invested in our lives, it will grow within us. So you say, well, what happens if I fail? No, you won't fail. If God has given you gifts to use for him, and he's given you opportunities to use those gifts, and you need to step out in faith and take a risk, do you think he's going to let you fall and fail? No. Because he wants each one of us to succeed. And so those gifts, if we're faithful and taking the first step and using it a little bit, it's going to grow. And then we use it a little bit more, it's going to grow. And then we step into this opportunity, it's going to grow. And as it grows, we are increasing the investment that God has placed within our lives and we're growing into our full capacity. Are you with me? You've got to be faithful over a little before you're gaining more. It's just the way it is. So what has God given you? What are you doing with it? How are you investing it in the kingdom? How are you using the opportunities that God may be placing before you, opportunities of relationship, of, 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 um, of ministering to other people through the uniqueness of who you are? How are you using that? Make a list of the things that God has given you in your personality and resources and opportunities and pray over them and say, Lord, use me. You know, if we are faithful over a little, we gain more. And it says that we can enter into the joy of the master. He says, come and share the master's happiness other translations, it says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. What's the joy of the master? Simply having him pat you on the shoulder and say, good work. No, that's not it. You know what the joy of the master is? Fellowship with God comes through common labor, through sharing labor. When we work with God, not just for him, but work with God, to see things change, lives transformed. There's a joy within us that that comes. It's deep down. It's different than happiness or giddiness. It's a joy that comes when we accomplish something together. Now, um, you know, Melody, Jeff, and Carol and I were working on, on their new house. And by the way, we have a leadership community meeting. I forgot to mention that. Next Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock, um, and it's going to be in their new house, so you want to come and join. But just let me know that you're coming so we can plan for that. But everyone's invited in our leadership community. We're going to be talking about, um, you know, uh, where we're going in the new year and things like that. But anyways, that's next Sunday night. When we were working together to take this house that was in ramshackle shape and transform it, you know, we worked hard. It was like, you know, six weeks. And, um, and, but there was something of a sense of accomplishment together 
when you look at that and you go, oh my goodness, this looks good. You know, there's a joy of accomplishment when something is done. Wouldn't you say that, Tom? You finish building this uh, intricate bookcase and you look at it and you say to the painter, don't mess it up. It looks good. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's something about common labor when you're working together with somebody else and you get done. There's a joy within you. That same thing is true with God. When we join with him in working in the things of his kingdom, um, there's a fellowship that comes. God is in business, and he wants us to join his business, and it's called father and sons, father and daughters. It's his family business. And when we labor with God, we get to enter into his joy. What is God's business all about right now? What's he doing? Making disciples. It's all about transforming lives. It's all about people coming to put their trust in Jesus and learning to live God's life uh, in God's way. Um, it, it's, 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 it's really about relationship. And we get to be involved in making a difference in somebody else's life. You get to make a difference in somebody else's life. That's joining God in his business. God's going to use each one of us. He's going to use you to make a difference in somebody else's life. If you're willing to let him make a difference in your life. And so, entering into the joy of the master is discovering our destiny. It's the outworking of the capacity of our stewardship. It's where we serve, and we all serve in different places. And we all connect with different people. Imagine if over the next year, every single one of us could make a difference in one person's life. They put their trust in Jesus. They grow in understanding how to live with Jesus. And they, they, they join our family of fellowship. The double in size. But more than that, we'd quadruple in influence. That's God's business. And that is, you know, the investment that God wants us to make. And so, simple question. What are you doing with your own discipleship? How is God teaching you to rule over your life? Over your time, over your resources, over your force? What opportunities has God given you to invest your life in other people for the sake of the kingdom. That is what Jesus was talking about in this parable. The lazy servant couldn't see it. He didn't love God. He feared God. The other servants loved God. And that lazy servant went and hid his talent, and he missed out. And so... I want you to think in terms of living out this reality of our being a servant and a steward, of walking in the fullness of our destiny. And the idea of destiny basically is what kind of kingdom investment does God want your life to make in the lives of others around you, family, friends, coworkers, whomever is open. What's that investment? He's given us talents that as we use them for his glory, we'll grow. Will you commit yourselves to walking with God, loving him, fearing him, as sons and daughters who relate to God as a loving father, as servants who are who will serve the purposes of God as he enables us and as stewards joining in common labor with God sharing in the joy of our master. Will you enter God's school of training for reigning? What an incredible opportunity that we have to join with God in this business. Let's not miss it. Let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you that you are working in our lives in a powerful, powerful way. And I pray for each one of us, Lord. Some of us have been walking with you for many, many years. There are those here today who are considering giving their life to Jesus. Draw us closer to you, Lord. Lord, we want to ask you forgiveness for not being diligent to watch over our lives and to use them for your glory. We've wasted time. In fear, we've missed opportunities. We've been more afraid of other people than we have been of you. So, Lord, set us free from the fear of man. Let us not be like that wicked servant that was so afraid of, uh, of, of being a disappointment that he was unwilling to take any risks. And he took what was given to him and he simply hid it. Lord, don't let us hide our lives. But, Lord, let our lives shine like a lamp on a lampstand so that all will see. Lord, encourage us today to um, be loved by you as sons and daughters, to be servants willing to give our lives for the sake of seeing other people's lives change. And Lord, show us the investment you've made in us so that we can make an investment in other people. Lord, we embrace the accountability that we have with you because you're a loving Father who wants us to succeed in every way. You have given us the ability to succeed. Lord, uh, give us the gumption. And we ask, Lord, all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. And by the way, we do have lunch downstairs. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that earlier or not. Um, Bopa, thank you for um, being willing to host. And, um, and, and Bopa and Pana, they've got one more Sunday here. Then they're going to Florida for some reason. I, I don't know. It's like, um, you know, I, I can't imagine leaving snow behind. But, uh, but, uh, but next week we want to pray over you. But this, this is the last luncheon that they're going to be with us for a couple of months. So please stay. Um, and um, our blessing is found in Ephesians chapter 3. This is God's promise to us. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church, that's us, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever.